that we can share this time with you and we're going to sing our some of our faves our traditional favorites this morning for easter so enjoy it but we have to get one thing in is tradition that we would say this morning he is risen he, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed amen Thank you. 
have some morning announcements we want to put before you. So in particular, we have a new opportunity for you. Um, in the midst of all this COVID-19 uh, you know, um, situation, we do, there are still some significant needs. And we know even within our own church family, there are needs. Um, but we, we have heard and want to help a ministry that um, is in a, the Philadelphia area for families who are truly, deeply struggling. So, um, and this is a Nazarene Compassionate Ministry. It's called Front Step. And so you have a couple of ways that you can get involved. And um, in particular, we're going to have a bin out here under the portico. So you'll be able to drive by and drop in some items. So I'll just give you a couple of um, examples of what we're looking for. But then please watch Facebook um, and watch your email. And we're going to be sending this out with more you know, specific instructions. But in particular, for, for this ministry, they are looking for us to um, donate some food, canned items, vegetables in particular. Um, and we're also hoping that we can collect some paper goods for them, like paper towels, of course, toilet paper, if, you know, even if you could spare some. Um, and those kinds of things, napkins, even plastic utensils. These are families, again, that um, are you know, in a situation where they don't have um, even the most basics. Any sanitizer, I know that's hard to come by, but if you have any and you're willing to share, we'd put that in and take it to Philly for you. Um, and then also they've asked for games and books. So they're trying to keep, you know, everybody occupied while they're um, in their homes um, and um, or when they're at the center, those kinds of things. So that's something we wanted to offer out to you as a way to still participate and still give of, you know, yourself in a way to serve. Um, and then they do on their website. You can also just go on and make a cash donation. So um, that's something to be watching for. That's something new for us, and we're very excited to be able to help the people. It's, a, it's in um, Fenton Park, it's like North Philly somewhere. So. Stenton Park. Oh, Stenton. I was going to say but, Fenway. Okay. Yeah. Fenway Park, something else. Okay, Stenton Park. Okay, here you go. Um, good morning. I, I just w wanted to say uh, thank you for your faithfulness in giving during this time. Um, it, uh, I've had more people speak to me about giving either that they're going to give or just asking me about how they give in general so I just kind of wanted to uh, give you a few ways that you can give we do have a text and give number that's 610-510-2331 you just put that in your phone and then you text give and then it'll ask you how much would you like to give and then you can put the dollar amount uh, you know dollar sign and then the amount and um you can give that way. Uh, you can also go to our website, OxfordNazarene.org. There's a Give tab. You can just hit that and fill in your information. You can give that way. Um, if you're familiar with online banking, um, that's probably one of the better ways to give, where you can just um, ask your bank uh, to send uh, the Oxford Church of the Nazarene a check. You can uh, even sign up for repeated gifts, you know, every Sunday or every other Sunday or however you normally would give. And, um, and then you can also mail it. Our mailing address is 116 East Locust Street here in Oxford. And um, you can also drop it by the office. Um, we're, we're here Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 8.30 to 3. So if you want to drop your gift by, you can. I just wanted to read to you um, just a verse from 2 Corinthians where Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about giving. And he says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. So thank you for your cheerful giving. It is very helpful to the church. And we pray that God would continue to bless you and thank you for blessing the church. Now stay tuned. We have just a few more announcements.
Good morning. We are so glad that you can join with us this morning. We're starting a new sermon series, and it's talking about fear. And it's based on Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Um, it's the idea that Jesus' name is above all names. So I've asked Pastor Kerry to read uh, to us this portion of uh, Scripture. So I'm starting with Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 19. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. Now, we decided on this passage of Scripture even before COVID-19 happened. But when I, when I originally read that and I started to think about anything else, and three words just popped into my head just immediately. And it was, it was thinking about death, divorce, and disaster. And um, now we're not going to talk about divorce specifically, but just the idea. There's, there's just so many things that can just completely destroy our lives and those three words just kind of jumped into my mind so we're going to be talking about fear and we're going to be uh, kind of answering questions like this is well is his name above COVID-19 and the answer is yes then you say well people are dying and unfor- and it's very true and very unfortunate but even at Easter we don't celebrate the idea that people never die but we celebrate the idea of resurrection and that Jesus has power over death So the next few weeks, we're going to be struggling with the tension of trusting Jesus while we live in a world full of fear and uncertainty. We really hope you'll join us on our journey.
Good morning. If you're just joining with us, I'm Pastor Larry, the pastor of the Oxford Church of the Nazarene in Oxford, Pennsylvania, and we are glad that you're joining us online. Today is a great day for me because uh, since I've been in the ministry about 30 years, I've never really been able to spend time with my extended family, uh, you know, my mom and dad and brothers and sisters, but now thanks to um, this video and stuff, I'll be able to do that, at least if they decide they might want to watch, but mom, I know you're going to be watching, so uh, happy Easter and good morning. But... Um, we're hopefully you're sitting around uh, your television with your family and uh, thinking about all that Easter means to you. And I, I pray that this would be a great day of uh, just really thinking about God's blessings in your life. And if you're struggling today, I, I pray that God would really help you um, deal with all of this. I know a lot of people have been very isolated. So uh, I do pray for you and I pray that God would help you as you deal with this time together. We have been um, focusing this week as a church on Holy Week. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but there's a few ways that you can watch us. You can watch us on Facebook Live. You can uh, go to YouTube. And if you search OCN Nazarene, you'll uh, find us there. And, and then we also have a dial-in number that you can call. So uh, there's several ways that you can watch us. I just helped Bill Freeze um, just the other day. Uh, you know, figure out how we can do this on his phone. He's got a smart TV, so we're going to uh, help him do that. So if you have any kind of technical questions during the week um, and you are in our area, you know, we'd love to try to help you walk through that uh, so that you can watch our services. But this week we've been reading through Mark's gospel and um, Mark has been taking us on a journey and we've been watching. Uh, we really kind of started our journey just after... Um, the um, the uh, Last Supper with Jesus and the disciples. And we've talked about the Garden of Gethsemane and, and Jesus' trial. And uh, Friday, we had a, our special guest speaker was Wyvon Janae McCartney. And she read from Mark's Gospel talking about Jesus' crucifixion, his death, and his burial. And so we're going to pick it up from there this morning. And um, we're glad it didn't end there, but there's, there's good news. It's interesting. Mark's Gospel is very abrupt as it ends... Um, as it ends at the end of his gospel. So we are going to look at a little bit at Luke today, but um, we wanted to just continue in Mark and hear uh, his thoughts about all that happened in the last few days of Jesus's life. So we're going to be reading in Mark uh, chapter 16, uh, verses 1 to 8. So if you have your Bibles and want to read along, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But it said, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Now, they took Jesus' body down near the end. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take and bury the body. So he did. It was late. They really didn't get to do everything that they wanted to do. So here are these ladies then now coming uh, on Sunday morning to finish preparing Jesus' body. And um, Mark says, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? As I was reading this, it just struck me, really the humanity uh, that we see expressed here. Um, I asked my dad when he was still alive if he would write down a, uh, the history of his life, and so he did that for me uh, one year. And in, this, um, in his life history, he, he talked about when his father passed away. And he said he was so upset that they had to medicate him um, so he could finally get some sleep and settle down and he ended up missing his actually missing his father's funeral because how upset he was so you can see here that these ladies even though that they wanted desperately to to do the respectable and right thing for Jesus in his body they were how um, upset that they were that they even though they knew there was a great stone over the uh, tomb they, it never dawned on them until the, literally they get there but um, when they do get there, uh, Mark says they looked up and they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. So that ended up not being an issue for them. And Mark says they entered the tomb and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed, as you would be. 
Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified, but he is risen. He is not here. See the place where uh, they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered. I mean, obviously, they're going to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body. And um, now all of a sudden, there's somebody sitting in the tomb. The stone is rolled away, and um, he says that Jesus is risen. It says, trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, here's where I want to bring a little of Luke's commentary of this same moment um, and what he says about this. So he's quoting the, the angel that's in the tomb. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Now it's interesting to me, as Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem, he kept telling his disciples, this is what is going to happen to me. But it seemed to me like the, the words and the concept just seemed to go over uh, their disciples' heads. And even now it says, um, then they remembered his words. So they remembered Jesus saying them, but they just couldn't put the picture together. It just didn't make sense that their Lord, their rabbi, their, the Messiah would die. It just didn't compute for them. But I think one of the things that's so important is that Jesus really wanted his disciples to understand who he was. Last week for um, the triumphal entry, Jesus had his disciples go get this donkey fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, which says, See your king coming, lowly and gentle, riding on a donkey. So he's fulfilling Old Testament prophecy for the Messiah. So Jesus wanted his disciples to know he is the Messiah. He is Lord. And um, he is master, even of death. Now, in Paul's letter to the Romans, he gives us again some insight into who Jesus uh, is. And so when we think about um, you know, we're, what we're dealing with here today, it's very important for us to understand that everything revolves around the person of who Jesus is. So Paul helps us to get this insight. He says, the good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he makes this proclamation. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. The proclamation of the early church, Jesus is Lord. So for us, for those who are in the church, for those who are Christians, for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, our confession is that he is Lord. And even like our series text talking about his name being above every name. So Jesus Christ is Lord. Now one of the things that is so important, and I say this every Easter because I want Christians to understand how central the idea of the, uh, the resurrection is to our faith. Paul says, in actually an earlier letter, although it comes a little bit later in the Bible, he says this, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So Paul puts this right up to say, listen, if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, this is, this is all just about words. But he knew it wasn't just about words. And so he elevates the resurrection to just a, a central point in the gospel message. That Jesus Christ really rose from the dead. And actually in this passage that comes a little bit earlier, Paul says that over 500 people saw the risen Christ. So it's not just, hey, we're making up a story, we want you to believe it. But he's saying, hey, there are people out there, people who are still alive that you can meet and talk to that saw Jesus again after he rose from the dead. Generally, for Easter, I'm always thinking about the skeptic. And um, so I, a lot of times, try to bring in facts and figures and just different quotes from different um, 
uh, not just theologians, but scholars and just different people. I'm not going that direction, but I want to encourage you, if you tend to be more of a skeptic, that there are answers out there for you. And um, if you are interested in pursuing that, but you don't know where to start, if you want to email me at ocnchurch at gmail.com, I'd love to have a conversation with you about your faith and pursuing your faith. I know one of the um, kind of the steps in my Christian faith was after I uh, joined the army when I was um, right after I graduated from high school. I did my basic training in AIT in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and then I was uh, my duty station was in Erlangen, Germany. And while I was there, I really started experiencing a lot of persecution for my faith. You know, people were making fun of who I was and what I did do and what I didn't do and all those things. And I remember just being overwhelmed by um, how people just really, really persecuted me for my faith. So I remember going to the chapel one time. I was wanting to talk to the chaplain and outside of his door there was some tapes and there was a tape there that said seven reasons why the Christian faith is intellectually feasible and I remember taking that tape and listening to it over and over and over and over again I remember thinking listen I'm not going to spend my life being persecuted for something that I cannot wrap my head around so if you're somebody that's thinking hey I I hear what you're saying and I'm intrigued by it but I'm not just going to buy it because you say it I've been there But um, God has answers for you, and there's answers that you can find. And so if that's where you're at on the journey, I want to kind of walk with you. And so I just encourage you to uh, connect with me, and um, we can begin to talk. So I just want to review with you our, um, our overall series theme verse, which is now he, and the he in this verse is Jesus. Now Jesus is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but in the world to come. So for me, as I thought about this, particularly as I thought about fear, and it's interesting that even before all of this happened, in my mind it was this thought about um, how we can live in these very, very uncertain times and often very fearful times. And certainly with this COVID-19, it's just, uh, we just understand how really vulnerable we are as people. So when we think about the resurrection, it helps us to see the power of God. You know, if you're in the church, you can talk about the resurrection like it's not a big deal. But if you're just somebody who's thinking about somebody being raised from the dead, that's a huge deal. It just doesn't happen. Without the input of the God of the universe, it just doesn't happen. People just don't uh, raise up from the dead. They just don't. And so Jesus had been beaten, he had been stabbed, he had been crucified, he was dead as dead could be, and um, God rose him from the dead, showing his power um, over really what is our greatest enemy, which is death. But there's an issue where we think about who Jesus is, but then what about all the difficulties that we experience in this life? And so we want to be thinking about, okay, here's Jesus, but here is my life. And how can Jesus, who has a name that's above every name, help me live the life that I have to live? So that's what we want to do these next few weeks, especially as we deal with the fears that we struggle with um, every day. So I want to... As I was thinking about this message and the resurrection and the fear of death, and I thought, and I certainly have been thinking about death far more, uh, I began to look online and think, what are Americans uh, afraid of? And um, I, I ran across a lot of different studies, one particularly from Chapman University. It was a survey of fears that they did in 2018. And... Um, as I read that survey, I remember being taken back a little bit because the number one thing by far was the fear of corruption of government officials. So that was the number one. And then the number two was the fear of polluting our oceans, rivers, and lakes. Number three in that particular study was fear of polluting our drinking water. Uh, The fourth in that study was fear of not uh, having enough money for the future. And then all the way, uh, it was five where uh, there was the fear of our loved ones becoming sick. And sixth was actually our loved ones dying. So it really 
was farther down on this list, this issue of dying, and then it went to things like air pollution and global warming, extinction of plants and animals, and then uh, high health care cost. So I'm reading all these lists, and they're all over the place, and they're all, people are afraid, a lot of people in America are afraid of a lot of different things. But there wasn't this sense that, one, the fear of dying was high on people's list. And as I was kind of studying, one author said that, people's fears tend to be reflected in what the media is talking about. So if, if the media is talking about terrorism, then there tends to be an elevated fear of terrorism. Or um, if, you know, just whatever happens to be in the news for the day, that's kind of where people are. But there is a, a truth, though, that there are five fears that we all share. Five fears that we all share. And um, the first is this fear of extinction or the fear of dying. And of these five fears, that becomes the base fear that um, is ahead of everything else. You know, there's uh, one of the fears, so it's fear of extinction, fear of mutilation, the things happening to our body, loss of autonomy that we, 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 we don't have control anymore. Uh, separation is a fear. And then a fear of our um, Dr. Albrecht, who um, wrote this article that I was reading, was talking about the ego death or this idea of humiliation or shame, fear of these things. But they all start out with a fear of death. That is the primary one they that kind of trumps all other fears but um, and again for me I, I would say maybe before this message started you weren't thinking about death maybe you were maybe you weren't thinking about it in a personal way but this COVID-19 has me thinking about death a lot um, my habit these past couple weeks has been I'll roll over in the morning I'll grab my phone and I'll start looking at the articles and one of the things that I search almost every day is what was the daily death toll in the United States. And um, so with all of this talk about dying and COVID-19, and I remember early on um, they were talking about projected death numbers, and um, but they were talking about well, what it was like if you get COVID-19 and how it, for some people it's really relatively mild, for other people it's like a severe case of the flu. And I remember looking up um, the number of people who die every year from the flu. When I, when I did, when I was reading this uh, article that talked about these death numbers, it was, mid, excuse me, it was mid-February. So at mid-February, there had already been 16,000 people in America alone died that this flu season, 16,000. And by that time, COVID was nowhere even close to that. And I remember thinking, 16, I mean, we're talking about all this COVID stuff, but wow, 16,000, I, I don't even think about people dying um, from the flu. But again, this this thought and now the numbers are going up and, and the number of people dying around the world is just just skyrocketing and um, so I think for a lot of us um, whereas we normally wouldn't be thinking about death now we are thinking about death so um, that's really what I want to talk about uh, today so I want you to take a minute. Most of you are probably not here, and, and a lot of us want to say, I don't, I don't want to think about dying. I, I, don't, I don't want to think about dying. Now, I've been a pastor in the church for uh, 30 years. I've been a part of a lot of different funerals and deaths. It seems like the only um, thing that I haven't really been a part of is really like an elementary age child. Other than that, I've, I've had personal experiences uh, with death. About three years ago, there was a period of maybe a month or three weeks or something like that where I participated in a, the funeral of a 48-year-old, a 49-year-old, and a 50-year-old. I was 50. But you still, even though as a pastor I'm around death, I don't think about it like I'm thinking about it now. And so even for you, I'd like you to take a minute. You know, we're so distracted. I, I, I think about it. I wake up, I look at my phone, and I have my phone in my hand before I go to bed. So Americans seem to be distracted, but there is this truth. There is this idea of death, and we really, none of us know when it's going to come. So I want to take a minute because I feel like... Um, the gospel has something to say to us in a good sense about this idea of death and that we don't have to fear it. 
But in order to hear this good news, we've got to think about it for a minute. So I want everybody, no matter where you're at and what you're thinking, what do you think about death? What is your personal view of death? What, what happens to you after you die? Does anything happen to you after you die? And so as I, I thought about that, I kind of thought about it in three kind of general sense. Plus I thought about what is the Christian message uh, for death. But now, I don't know that there are a lot of people who look at death this way, but I think there's a growing number of look at, uh, people who look at death this way, and that's this naturalistic idea. People from, who look at death this way, they don't consider God to even be part of the picture. Life just is what it is. Um, everything happened by accident and chance. And so our universe came together by accident and chance. And we developed by accident and chance. And, and so if you're born, you're just born. You were fortunate enough, or you're not even fortunate, you, just, you were born. And you exist. And one day you'll die and you'll be no more. And so um, there are those who kind of view life in that very naturalistic perspective. That's, I'm oversimplifying, but it's the idea that we're here by accident. Our life really has no ultimate significance. And when we die, there's really no, uh, it, it, we just die. Now, in some ways, that can be helpful to people to know that when I die, I am just dead. Uh, but in another sense, I think that there's something in all of us. You've heard the sayings that there are no atheists in foxholes. I think sometimes we can um, maybe academically think about death and think, you know what, I just believe that once you die, you're dead. But there seems to be this nagging thought, and I think it's actually a gift from the Lord that there's something beyond this world that we see and this world that we live in. Um, and so if there is, well, then what does that mean? So this naturalistic mindset of, well, I'm dead, I, I die, I'm dead, that might be helpful for a minute, but when we really start to think things, when we, when we really start to think about it, or we really are faced with death ourselves, um, are we going to be able to say, well, I, I, if I die, I die, that's just it. So there's that thought when we think about it. And then there's this other thought, I think, that really is common, and I really see it a lot when I deal with people who are dealing with death. I don't know when it was, but there was a um, movie at one time that said, uh, all dogs go to heaven. And, um, and I think we kind of have this idea that all people go to heaven. Um, at least the vast majority of people. But then there's always this exception where all people can't go to heaven because we have people who are terrible. And so one of the things I, I think in our world is this idea of justice. We all have this sense that certain people don't deserve to go to heaven. So our, our mindset is just loosely, most people go, but some people can't because... Um, the universe is just, and it just doesn't seem right that people who do awful things get to go to heaven. And you know, at, at my age, I, first person I think of is Hitler. And those people who did all those terrible things to the Jewish people, and not just the Jewish people, but so many more people. And so you think, well, those people certainly can't go to heaven. And so if your mindset is, well, basically everybody goes because, and I certainly would go because I'm pretty good, at least I'm pretty good compared to other people, but then when we start to really think about what that mindset means, so where is the line? I remember when, um, this was probably in the early 2000s, I believe it was Lancaster, there was a boy who starved to death, chained to the cabinets in his family's home, and the, the the article said that he died inches from food and he had been he had been chained there by his parents and I'm thinking do those people get to go to heaven um, I have a actually a friend and he was deeply hurt and he confessed to me and he's confessed to me more than once he said if I could kill this person if I could somehow not be found out or found guilty I, I wouldn't hesitate to kill this person now this is a person some of you would look at from the outside and think they're a normal person. They, they do nice things. This person does nice things for me. But 
in their heart, if they knew they could get away with it, they would just kill this person. And so again, even as we start to think about justice and judgment, where is this line? Um, Jesus said, if you decide that you would do it in your, in your heart, you've already, you're, you're already guilty of it. So where is this line? And so where do we, you know, even though we think we're good people, when we think about our thoughts, when we think about the things that we have done in secret, and we might look good on the outside, but really how good are we on the inside? It, that idea of most people go to heaven, but where is that line? And then we start to think, where do I fall? It's, uh, it's a little disconcerting. And I think that there's this um, kind of a spiritual idea of this same idea. And that's for people who've kind of grown up in the church and they understand that Jesus died for their sins. And if they believe in Jesus and ask him to forgive their sins, that when they die, they'll go to heaven. And so if when they think about death, they think, I'm going to heaven. Well, why are you going to heaven? Because I believe in Jesus. But then when you really begin to look at their life, or even if that's you, and you start thinking, well, what about your life indicates that you believe in Jesus? Is it merely that statement of fact, I believe in Jesus, I've asked him to forgive me, and so when I die, I'm not going to go to heaven. But there's nothing else about your life that would indicate that you really do believe in Jesus. You don't, you're... Your behavior is not shaped by what Jesus would have you do. Um, Your life is not even particularly directed by what Jesus would have you do. And so one of the things that I always try to do when I think about my relationship with God, I think if my relationship with God, if if I had a physical relationship like this, would it be healthy or would it, would it work? And so often, I, the way we treat God, we say, oh, I believe in him, but he's completely pushed off into some corner of our life. And we say we believe in him, but, we, but really nothing about our life indicates that we do. So when you begin to think about that, it's like, is God fooled by this idea that, well, we say we believe in him, but do we really believe in him? So I think, again, that we can begin to be afraid. And then finally, I want to talk about people who definitely have a belief that there is a God. There is a God, judgment is certain, and how they view death in the end is going to be, well, do my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds? And uh, I think, again, there's some positive in this in the sense that it gives us something to shoot for. We want to do more good things than we have done bad things. And um, But again, the drawback from this is, well, how can we ever really No. So for me, none of these ways or any kind of variation of these ways alleviate for me me the fear of death. So the question for us this morning was, what what, what does the Christian message say? Again, for you, I'm not. How do you look at death? What what are you basing the fact that you are afraid of death or that you're not afraid of death? So what does the Christian message say? Now I. I grew up in the church. I feel like I went to a great church. I feel like I had great pastors. I lived in a Christian home. Um, I feel like if you would have given me a test on what it means to be a Christian or what the church believes, or if you ask me facts about God based on on the Bible, I would be able to answer all those things. But here is kind of the background for me when it came to death and dying and judgment and those kind of things. I understood that God was holy and he hated sin. He didn't hate sin just arbitrarily, but he hated sin because sin destroys people. And uh, even when you think about that, that boy that I mentioned that was chained to the cabinets, whose parents sin, how, how, would, how could somebody do those kind of things? So God is holy and he hates sin. And I also knew from the scriptures and from the church that, that I was sinful. And I really was. And for so many of us, even if we can't point to a lot of sinful things for all of us we've really become God of our own lives where we want to call the shots and we want to do what we want to do so so God is holy I'm sinful and I also understood that I was responsible for my sin and one day I would be judged and that always made me afraid there was going to be a day of judgment 
And I was always terribly afraid of that day because I understood that there was this concept of hell and it was the worst place possible to spend eternity. And so I was afraid on that day when I stood and looked, of, looked into the face of God Almighty that I would be found wanting and that hell would be a place for me. And so I was very afraid. But that wasn't the whole message of the church, certainly. There seemed to be a kind of a however. You know, yes, those things are true. God is holy. You're sinful. You're responsible for your sins. Hell is real. And people are going to go there. But there was also this message of Jesus Christ died for our sins. And if I ask Jesus to forgive me of my sin, and if I ask Jesus to come into my heart, that when I die, I get to go to heaven. But it, it's an interesting kind of contradiction in this thing where it's um, really this sense that God is against me, but Jesus is a loophole for me. That really, ultimately, God is just waiting for me to mess up so he can send me to hell. But if I put my faith in Jesus, it's kind of a loophole. And so, let me just tell you, that's a completely wrong way to look at things. And even though I grew up in the church and I understood, I understood the scripture, that was kind of this this context for me of my faith that God was ultimately against me and that Jesus was this loophole that I could get, uh, I could skirt the consequences of my sin. But that's a completely false way to look at things. So I want to look at a verse that's very, very familiar to everybody. Um, I learned it in church. It's John 3.16. And... Um, and even though I knew this, that God so loved the world, still there was this sense because of God's holiness, because of my sinfulness, that God was really ultimately against me. I remember literally, because it was when I was pastor here in the either late 90s or early 2000s, I was just studying the Bible one day and it dawned on me that God is for me. That God is for me. Not that God serves me or that God is there to do my bidding, but that God is for me. Jesus says in the New Testament, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And I thought here, I've just, even in the ministry, I've been thinking that God is kind of against me. But God is not against me. God is for me and God is for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And even though it talks about love, that wasn't my mindset of God. My mindset was that, yeah, he loves me, but he's, you know, if I do the wrong things, he's ready to send me to hell. And we don't usually think about this next verse, but it's also it's just almost as powerful or as powerful as the verse just preceding it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So it wasn't this idea that God is against me and that Jesus is a loophole, but that God is for me. And he sent Jesus into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so that's true for us today. So even as we think about this truth that, one, for all, we're all going to die. And we need to think through what does that mean? And if we have the naturalistic mindset, then we need to think through it. And is this where I'm willing to put all my eggs? Or am I just going to have this general idea that, you know what, I'm basically pretty good. There's no way God could send me to hell forever. That's only for the worst of the worst. So we have to think through, where am I at? How do I, how do I process this idea of dying? How do I process this idea that God um, really loves me? And here's where we need to go back really to the beginning, this idea of Jesus dying. And then God showing his ultimate power over death. For me, I don't have to fear death because the one I trust has defeated death. I think for so many people, your confidence in your ultimate destiny is in your hands. And that's the last place where I want my ultimate destiny is in my own hands. My trust and my hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did die on the cross for my sins. And I do believe in him. Not just believe in this kind of this air quotes idea that I'm just going to live the rest of my life as if he doesn't exist. But when I die, I'm going to say that I believe that he does. 
So I don't have to fear death and you don't have to fear death if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we find ourselves at the place. Now I'm coming to the end of my message now and it's so hard for me to know. I don't even know how long I've been preaching, but Jesus is this verse that I'm going to share with you, the, the context of it is Jesus has been sent for because a, a man named Lazarus was sick. So his sister sent word, have Jesus come because the one he loved is sick. Well, by the time Jesus makes it to Lazarus, he's dead. And the one thing Martha keeps saying to Jesus over and over again, if you would have been here, he would be alive. You could have healed him. If, if you would have only come, you could have healed him. And so Jesus has this conversation with her. And Jesus says this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The great thing about Easter is not the truth that nobody dies because people do die. People we love die. We will one day die. The great truth about Easter is there is a resurrection. And Jesus tells Martha, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying even after dying what do you believe he goes on to say everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die do you believe this Martha so for all of us today we we have to answer Jesus questions do we really believe this and not just saying, oh yeah, I believe it, but there's no evidence in our life. Do we really believe this? There's a passage in scripture that has Jesus saying this, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Now, I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you've slowed down a lot, uh, enough to think about this idea that death is really very real and really very real in your life and the life of the people that you love. But I'm hearing that a lot, that this is causing me to slow down. And so hopefully even this morning, you've slowed down enough to think, what do I think about death? I asked one person, uh, I said, what do you think about all this? And they told me, I'm terrified. I'm terrified. We don't have to be afraid, even if it dawned on me that one day, I'm 54, I'm, I'm not too far outside of this um, group of people who are uh, most susceptible of that. I could die, you can die, whether you're old or whether you're young. But Jesus says, listen, even if you die, you can live if you believe in me. So the question for all of us is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? So as we answer that question again, I want you to hear Jesus saying to you, listen, come to me all who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. I want to pray for you today as you think about this because I think one of the incredible blessings of being in relationship with God, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, is that we don't have to be afraid of death. But again, the focus is not on ourselves, how we do things right in order to be saved, but that we put our trust in Jesus. He is the one who has defeated death. And then if we believe in him, we know that we can also live with him. So I want to take a minute and pray for you. And maybe you're at a place and we've just... Um, got this new text line. It's 610-924-7215. And if you um, would you know, text to that number and hit prayer, and then tell us what you would like us to pray for you about. We will get back with you and talk with you because Jesus is, is asking you this morning, do you believe this or are you struggling with something? Well, we want to come uh, around you and we want to support you in this. But let me pray for you. If you're a person who, when you really stop and think, you know what? I don't have a confidence. I am afraid of death. Uh, you don't have to be if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. So let me pray with you today. Heavenly Father, I know for most of us, we just never slow down enough to even think about dying. 
And Father, as awful as all that we're going through, the one blessing is, is that it does help us to stop and think. Father, thank you for the truth, not that you're against us, but that you're for us. And that Jesus is not a loophole. He was part of your plan. And so, Father, if there are people out there who've just been kind of playing and they've been just kind of telling themselves, I believe in Jesus, but they really have been living their life really for themselves. I pray that they would sense that you're reaching out to them, that you want them to come to you and that you want them to uh, cast their life and their cares and their fears on you. And so, Father, I would pray that there might be people out there today listening to me who maybe are recommitting their life to you or maybe who are trusting you for the first time. And I pray that you would help them to connect with us because it's so important that they be able to talk with somebody about the decision they've made. Thank you so much for loving us and caring for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am so glad that you could be with us today for the next three weeks we're going to be talking about fear and fear in these significant areas fear that we all share in common so i hope you'll um, tune in um, for the next three weeks where we're going to talk about jesus the name above other uh, the name above all names so whatever that you would name that fear that you're struggling with uh, we're going to deal with that as best we can so hope we can tune in uh, have a great easter
Shine.